on the East Coast, and good morning to all of you elsewhere in the country. Uh, I'm Andy Van Clunen. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of National Skills Coalition, and I want to welcome you to our Perkins pop-up briefing. Try saying that three times. This is our effort to kind of give you our initial hot takes on what has happened with the reauthorization of the Carl Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, which was just signed into law this past Tuesday. Uh, so this is breaking news, and we're happy to be able to kind of bring you some initial reactions to what we got out of this law, the work that is sitting ahead of us in terms of making sure that it is the most effective way that we're investing in the career and technical education of students and workers around the country in a way that's going to move them into good careers uh, in industries that are desperate to find people who can fill technical and middle school occupations. So welcome to the, all of you. We have a great crowd. We have over 700 of you dialing in on a summer Friday, so thank you for that. Particular welcome to our career and technical education program operators at our nation's high schools and colleges, other supporters of career and technical education, including our friends from the business community, and just all of those in the National Skills Coalition Network who think that we need to be doing more to invest in people to move them into good middle skill jobs. Um, Currently, all of you are on mute, but we're going to give you a chance to get involved in the conversation uh, at some point. Um, you'll see that there is a, on the screen that there's a, a place where you can type in Q&A questions. Uh, we'll be taking those as we proceed with the, with the call today. So particularly as you're listening to our panelists, if you've got some particular questions, type those in and I'm going to be trying to follow and kick those to our to our panelists during the second half of our call today. Also, if you're having any trouble hearing or connecting to the call or making any of those other functions work properly, there is a chat option, which you can see, which is different than the Q&A option. Uh, click on that and type us, tell us what your problem is, and we'll get somebody to you right away to see if we can get you fully into the discussion here. So just a quick word about uh, National Skills Coalition. For many of you uh, who are members and participants, thank you for the work that you do. For those who are new to the organization, we're a national organization based in Washington, D.C. that is working across a range of different federal and state policies to make sure that we are recommitting to investing in our people as our nation's greatest assets and moving forward the country's economy. Uh, and we work with a range of different stakeholders from the education and training and business uh, and uh, adv advocacy community, uh, many of you who are represented here today. And we have great national partners that we work with as well, two of whom are represented uh, on our expert panel uh, this afternoon, and I'm anxious to introduce you to them uh, and to get you uh, to give their initial reactions on their feelings about where we are now with career and technical education at the federal level. Um, I should mention that today's conversation is going to be relatively top line. We really just have the law as of a few days ago. Each of these organizations is going to be doing other more in-depth analyses of the, the law and, the, and what the process is for uh, moving it forward uh, and how it is that states are then going to be asked to start to implement this law. Uh, at the end of today's call, we'll show you links to get to the websites of all of these organizations so that you can find out some of the more detailed information that's going to be made available. But today, we're really just trying to kind of get at the initial reactions to what we have before us uh, with this new federal investment in career and tech education. So just as a little level setting, since I know that we have people who are experts in CTE and folks who are just highly interested in CTE, just to remind everybody about what we mean when we say career and technical education. Um, these are our programs at our high schools and our colleges that are preparing people with both the functional and technical skills to develop a career in a particular occupation or a more general industry cluster. It's about 12 and a half million students and workers who are being served by career and tech ed programs in our country today. About 8 million of those are high school students, about close to 4 million of them are folks that are enrolled in a community college or other post-secondary program. And as you all know, there's a great demand for these programs, particularly in industries that are struggling to fill middle skill occupations. And thankfully, it's an issue that now has gotten a great deal of support and attention on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, and indeed, this is one of those few 
issues where we actually can have Democrats and Republicans working together to move something forward. We're very glad that we finally got to the end here and got ourselves a new career and technical education law. Uh, the president himself has been an advocate for these programs, uh, and so that also helps us think through about how it is we're going to move these issues forward. Um, just to let folks know that the president did sign the, sign the bill into law on Tuesday. Uh, so the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, we're now calling it the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act, although for many of us that have been working on this, we probably will continue to call it the Perkins Act regardless. Uh, but that's the new law that we're going to be talking about today. Um, one other note I just want to make, even though we've had a lot of support for this issue, it's taken us quite a while to get this law reauthorized. It's more than five years overdue, and I want to, we're going to talk a little bit today about why that happened and what implications that had for the law that we, found, that we wound up with. Uh, and I also just want to acknowledge that even though we have over 12 million students enrolled in these programs and that there's great demand from them uh, in the business community, we're currently spending not even $1.2 billion a year on this program, which is much smaller than other education investments that we're making at the federal level. Um, thankfully, this new law provides a little bump to that, uh, to that funding, which we're gonna talk a bit about. But I do think we wanna also talk about how it is that we can continue to build the base and interest in these programs so that we're not just talking about what we've gotten from this law, but how we can move the appropriations conversation forward into the future. So let me turn this conversation over to our experts who can drill down on some of these issues. Uh, you see their beautiful faces there on your screen if you're dialed in. Um, so first is gonna be Kermit Kaliba. So Kermit's the Federal Policy Director here at National Skills Coalition. Uh, next to Kermit's face is Ned McCullough. So Ned is Global Issue Manager for Skill Development and Education at IBM, also based in Washington. Ned was a leader of the Perkins CTE Coalition. So this was a group of business leaders and other organizations in Washington that were working actively on the reauthorization of the Perkins Act. I'm also proud to say that Ned is a board member of National Skills Coalition. So Ned, good to have you here. Uh, and Kim Green, who is the Executive Director of Advanced CTE. So Kim is a longstanding leader in the career and technical education field. Advanced CTE, for those who don't know, is the professional association for the state directors of career and technical education from around the country, but there's many other people who pay attention to what Advanced CTE does. It depends on their analysis of uh, both how the programs are currently working and where it is that we can help to improve them moving forward. So it's great to have all three of you on the call today. And so I wanna start by turning a question over to each of you. So first, from the perspective of your organization or the coalition that you work on behalf of, could you tell our, uh, the folks who are listening and just a little bit about why it is that you cared enough about career and technical education to get involved in this reauthorization process? What's the perspective that your members and colleagues bring to this? And Ned, let me start with you, given where IBM has come from, both on career and tech ed, but also the larger business community that you've been bringing around these issues. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Andy, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, for us to talk about this. Uh, we were really happy with the passage of Perkins CTE, and we got into it because we wanted to help connect kids that were going through these classes with jobs. We have a lot of jobs open. I think a lot of employers have a lot of jobs open, and we depend upon uh, Kim's uh, folks and the teachers for these things to provide skills to the kids that can help connect them with our jobs. And we had some experience that started in New York City with our Pathways and Technology Early College High Schools that suggested that if we were to uh, work with the schools that they would be delighted and would be able to change their classes in ways that would help the kids advance toward jobs. Then we thought that we could improve the amount of work-based learning and ultimately uh, certifications that kids get out of this stuff, and that there was a real opportunity to drive this. And it wasn't just us, but we thought we could also work with the educators, with the unions and civil rights communities, and last but not least, with the National Skills Coalition to try to craft this legislation. So we're happy to um, we're happy to have gotten it enacted, and hopefully this fall we'll start seeing kids. Any better shot of jobs? 
Excellent. Thanks, Ned. And can you talk a bit about, because obviously IBM was interested, but there was a number of other business leaders that you were bringing to these conversations as well. Who were some of the other members of the coalition that you helped to organize? We um, thought that we could reach out to the folks in the HVAC industry or roofers, people in healthcare, automobile manufacturers, Boeing, financial services. It's very unusual for skills and staffing to be a comfortable place for any company at this point, particularly in fast evolving sectors like technology. It's, it's talked about all the time, but Boeing, for example, which was a leader in the coalition, has a significant amount of its workforce retiring in a hard time finding people with advanced manufacturing skills. Uh, Dwayne from the roofers has a hard time finding people in this thing. And for all of us, we had the same desire. We wanted to pick up the courses that were being taught at a high school, look at it and say, hey, yeah, those are the classes that are going to help those kids get closer to a job at our organization. And it didn't seem to make much difference, Andy, to your question, uh, which company we want to talk to or which sector we want to talk to. They were all feeling the pain, and now hopefully we'll all feel the gain from the improvements in the legislation. Excellent. So, Kim, let me turn to you. So you and your members are the ones who are have been implementing career and tech ed programs for years. Um, yes. So clearly you've got some invested interest in this, but coming into this reauthor, this long reauthorization discussion, how, where is it that you folks were coming from on, on where we hope things were going to wind up? Yeah, I mean, I think the beginning of this reauthorization, so the last law expired in 2012, we um, kind of followed a process that we always do, kind of you try to read the tea leaves about kind of where, um, what are the influences that are going to impact this legislation, and we knew that the Workforce uh, Investment Act, then eventually becoming the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, and No Child Left Behind were um, kind of also in the same time frame of getting reauthorized, and so we were aware of and cognizant of those influences, um, and also kind of looking at where the economy was, and then having honest conversations with our own community um, about kind of what's working, what's not working, where do we need to push, what do we need to make sure that we're um, continuing to invest in or accelerating and building momentum around. So we, as we've done with the last two reauthorizations that I was involved with, really began a conversation with our members of a fresh sheet of paper and saying, what do we need the federal government's help to do in CTE? What is happening um, in states? and what is happening at the local level, and then trying to kind of figure out where, uh, backwards map there, what our priorities are. And um, I mean, it was interesting kind of going into this reauthorization because there weren't like big things people were trying to fix. There, there generally, you know, the Perkins and the Federal Investment celebrated 100 years uh, last year, and so we kind of had that in the, the mix of things. And there, there weren't like big problems um, like people were trying to fix some of the issues around No Child Left Behind reauthorization when it went to ESSA. That wasn't the case for Perkins. And so um, to us, the real issues that we were trying to figure out how can we do better at A, making sure that we have um, strong, robust, and high quality programs that are meeting labor market demand and that those programs have um, are, are equitably accessed by different communities and different populations. And so thinking about, I think that was the lens through which we went into this reauthorization. Um, it was unlike any that I've ever been involved with. All, while the business community has always been a partner of, of vocational education and then CTE, um, I have gone on the record saying over and over again, I really don't think that if the employer community hadn't been involved in the way that it was this time, that we would have had a reauthorization, that there was a continued, I think, kind of drumbeat um, very consistently with the White House and with Congress about the importance of getting this across the finish line. And uh, while it was a collaborative effort, I think that the employers leading the way on this one is what really ultimately got it across the finish line. I've got to agree with you on that. Absolutely. Um, the fact that both between what's going on in the economy and where the business community has been willing to say that this is an area where the federal government can and should be doing more, I think that has made, that made a big difference. You mentioned yeah. issues on the equity side of, of yeah. where current tech ed is. Like, what were some of the things you were hoping to get accomplished on that front? Well, I mean, I think that um, 
you know, like one of the things that we've seen is a tremendous amount of activity at the state legislative level around CTE and really looking at kind of doing asset mapping about where where are our quality CTE programs, who has access to them. And so um, one of the things that we had hoped to do, and I think we do see in this law, is um, really making sure that there's intentionality about using your data, uh, using that to kind of both diagnose and evaluate what's working and where there are gaps and making sure that that data drives your future funding decisions. And so um, we had recommended and are pleased to see that the new law has this requirement for a local needs assessment that requires the locals to look at their data um, and at the initial start of the grant and to every two years after that, make sure that they're looking not just at the data as an aggregate, but at the subpopulation level as well. And so we think that's a, a good step forward. Data issues. We love to talk about data issues at National Skills yeah. Coalition. Maybe we'll come, we'll come back to that a little bit. But first, let me turn to Kermit. So Kermit, what did this organization, National Skills Coalition, why, why does it care about career and tech ed? What was it hoping that we were going to get out of this reauthorization discussion from the perspective of the members that we work with? Sure. Thanks, Andy. And uh, I would just, before we get started, I want to say, you know, uh, the, the best thing in many ways that we've gotten out of the Perkins uh, reauthorization process, from my perspective, is, is getting to work with Ed and Kim, who've been such terrific leaders in this space for for their uh, for their members and, and the folks that they're representing. So I want to say thank you to them for all their hard work on this. Uh, so from National Skills Coalition's perspective, right, as Indy said, we're a we're a multi-stakeholder coalition with you know business leaders, labor, community-based organizations, community colleges, and others. Uh, and I think we came into this. Um, a little bit with uh, the focus on ensuring that uh, that Perkins is uh, is uh, aligned with uh, other federal investments uh, uh, that are being made in education and training and employment to make sure that where uh, state and local leaders have uh, the resources they need in order to be successful, but also the opportunity to leverage those resources more effectively and efficiently. So, you know, if you think back, you know, Kim mentioned the reauthorization of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act in 2014. One of the key themes in that law uh, was Congress uh, really was looking for greater coordination and alignment between different federal programs. There'd been a lot of concerns about uh, from the field uh, and from business leaders and from job seekers about uh, the you know there are different federal programs. They don't always talk to one another. Sometimes they operate in silos, and sometimes they don't work well together at the at the, at the local level. So Congress uh, in WIOA really made you know had this intention of we want to see more coordination, more more uh, talking amongst programs, uh, more alignment around a strategic vision, and and making sure that different programs are fulfilling their role within that that context. So so we came into this with uh, with uh, from the Perkins. Uh, perspective, trying to think about sort of on the one hand, uh, how do we ensure that Perkins maintains its integrity? It is it, it is ultimately a program that is intended to invest in career and technical education programs at the secondary and at the post-secondary level, but at the same time, uh, making sure that that the Perkins conversation is happening uh, in in consultation with the conversations that are happening around WIOA implementation, uh, ESSA implementation, other federal programs that we're working on. I think. You see that, and, and I will say, I think one of the things you see in the final bill uh, is that Congress really did try to move more in that direction of making sure that uh, that, that federal programs are, are, are talking to each other more uh, more consistently at the state and the local level. Um, and I'll talk about in a minute some of the some of the ways in which they did that. But I think overall, um, the the bill did a good job of trying to balance. Uh, sort of the, the unique uh, needs of, of career and technical education providers and students while also uh, doing a, a good job of starting the conversation about how do we make sure that, uh, that, that education and training investments are working together effectively at the state and the local level. So overall, I think that the bill moves us in a good direction. Thanks, Kermit. And I think this idea about alignment between programs obviously is a very important one. Uh, and it's hard to do with just one piece of legislation. So I, I know that we want to get to later in the conversation, not just what's going to happen with Perkins and WIOA, which was reauthorized not so long ago, but a number of other pieces of federal legislation that are still on the docket and waiting to move forward. So we definitely want to get back to that. But Kermit, let me come back to you a little bit to talk a bit maybe just now to talk about the new law itself, and I'll ask you to take your first cut, and then I'll ask, I'll see if our other panelists want to weigh in too. So we were going to kind of give a summary of what the new law 
looks like relative to the old law? Like, what would you say? What would be your kind of top line um, pitch on that? Sure. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, in some respects, the law is, is you know, is very similar to uh, to previous law in, in some respects. So uh, as as before, there, you know, federal funding comes down to the to states by formula and uh, states have a fair amount of flexibility in terms of determining what percentage of funding goes towards secondary uh, programs and what percentage goes towards post-secondary programs. Uh, so in that sense, I think the law, the, you know, the, the basic infrastructure of the law, I, I, my sense is that it's fairly similar to uh, previous law. I think it does make some changes in terms of the sort of the implementation of the law uh, that, uh, that I think are, are worth noting. So uh, one thing that uh, changes is the, is the role of the state planning process and the state plan under Perkins. Uh, under the old law, the, the state plan uh, is, is, a, is a six year plan. Uh, the, the, the new uh, version of the law uh, makes it a four-year planning process, which is intended to align it with the four-year planning process under WIOA. Uh, it, uh, and it allows for a transition year uh, starting in 2019 uh, that will allow states, if they choose, uh, to align their Perkins planning cycle with their WIOA planning cycle. So uh, heading into 2020, uh, states can start to be thinking about how they're better integrating workforce and career and technical education planning uh, and, and make sure that they're, they're having those conversations. Um, the, uh, as Kim mentioned, there's, uh, there's changes in the, the local planning process, uh, particularly uh, the, what we've now, rather than calling it a local plan, it's called a, a local application. And then there's this new process, and I, Kim can probably talk more about sort of the, what it looks like, but there's, a, there's an emphasis on doing a kind of a comprehensive needs assessment at the local level uh, to evaluate uh, sort of how programs are performing, where programs need to be going, uh, what populations they're serving, and how those align with sort of industry, uh, in-demand industries and occupations. Um, there's changes in the performance metrics, which is, which is, I think is important, uh, at least, you know, particularly on the post-secondary level, you know, one of the things that National Skills Coalition had been advocating for was greater alignment with uh, the common performance metrics that were established under WIOA, uh, because one of the things we know at the, at the post-secondary level is we hear from community and technical colleges about the challenges of, of doing multiple rounds of reporting for the same program if they're reporting on multiple different funding streams. Um, and the, and the final law does adopt some of the WIOA common performance measures for post-secondary programs, particularly around uh, employment in the second quarter after program exit and attainment of a recognized post-secondary credential. Uh, the law does not adopt our, uh, uh, a proposal that was in the House version around uh, earnings, uh, capturing data on median earnings for program exiters, which I think is a is an unfortunate uh, step back from where the House had started off, but it does it does move us in a direction of better alignment along the common performance measures uh, in, in, in WIOA. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there's, you know, just generally the law has a number of, uh, has a number of uh, provisions, you know, particularly encouraging CTE to participate and support uh, career pathways at the state and local level. That's something the National Skills Coalition has long advocated for. Uh, uh, you know, emphasis on coordination with industry and sector partnerships. Uh, in the, uh, which are, uh, again, a feature of, of WIOA that uh, National Skills Coalition has advocated for, making sure that employers are engaged in the conversation uh, around uh, education and training opportunities in their communities. Uh, and then uh, there's a little bit of an emphasis, uh, more of an emphasis on work-based learning, which I think is a hot topic here in Washington. There's a lot of emphasis, a lot of interest from policymakers and businesses and others on uh, expanding apprenticeship and other work-based learning strategies. So there are some efforts within the new law to uh, make it easier for uh, for providers, for CTE providers, and other stakeholders to develop and implement work-based learning programs, which I think is is all to the good. So, uh, so I'll stop there and, and let others uh, weigh in with their thoughts. That that's great. Thanks, Kermit. And of course, again, just to reiterate, there will be a lot more detailed analysis that I think several of the organizations on this call are going to provide today. But I think Kermit, that was a, that was a nice summary. But uh, let me just return to Kim. Kim, is there anything else, kind of like big picture? things in this new law that you would highlight as significant changes or things to be paying attention to moving forward? Yeah, so I, I guess I want to just uh, maybe um, frame a little bit more about what uh, Kermit said around accountability because um, 
our legislation ended up being kind of the the proving ground for an an idea that had basically nothing to do with CTE, but um, is a, a fundamental shift in the way that the Congress is thinking about the relationship between the federal government and states um, around accountability and who's accountable. And so the, one of the shifts that got made under this law, I and mean, it was frankly the topic that um, held up negotiations for many, many months, was um, around whether or not the federal government can be negotiating performance targets with the states. So this is something that will be different in Perkins as compared to WIOA because there's still a negotiation process that happens between the Secretary of Labor and states under WIOA and setting targets. That is no longer required. Um, it actually is disallowed under this Perkins Act um, where the states are determining the targets and submitting them to the U.S. Department of Education. And basically the Secretary has the ability to say thumbs up or thumbs down, but can't be finagling over individual targets and um, and levels that are set. Um, in exchange for that kind of flexibility uh, that was being given to the states, there are significant number of new definitions, defined processes, defined um, reporting requirements, um, specifying you have to meet twice with the governor during the planning process, a much more extensive list of stakeholders that need to get involved. And, and essentially, um, our understanding is in the negotiation process, this all came about uh, all these additional requirements as a way of holding states and locals accountable to the public, um, given that they will not be held accountable to the Secretary of Education. And I think this is something to watch because um, it, I'll say it's a little bit of a worry point for me to know kind of how this will truly all play out. Um, I'm worried about the burden of some of these new things, but also um, whether or not this is actually like in the best interest of students and learners. And so um, it, it also, I think, poses, you know, a, a little bit of a conflict between, you know, one process that we're going to have to go through for accountability for Perkins and a different process that we're going to have to go through for accountability under WIOA. And I think we, too, were looking for there to be more systems alignment um, uh, under this legislation. And I, so I think it's there. But I'm worried that these processes may kind of interfere in the kind of ideal and aspirational um, sense of that systems alignment policy. The other just piece that I would add is um, as much as uh, we are um, trying to see alignment with WIOA under this law, Perkins also sits kind of at this crossroads of connecting to workforce development, but it also very much connects with the K-12 system and ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so there are connections to that as well. The on the secondary side, the academic indicators um, for graduation and uh, academic attainment for English language arts, mathematics, and science are the same um, for CTE students as they are for all students. So that um, sometimes uh, kind of feels like a push and pull. Um, we see the the greatest strength there of being a bridge builder between systems, but uh, there's a little bit of, I would say, inelegance in the way that some of those provisions got put into the law. And so we're hoping through kind of uh, implementation supports that we'll, we'll start to kind of see some of that um, choppiness kind of smooth out a little bit in terms of the implementation. So, and, and to that end, I'll just say, you mentioned um, we do have up on our website a, um, a red line of the bill, which is basically taking the language that got passed by Congress and integrating that into current law. So actually it's a readable um, policy as well as a fairly comprehensive uh, summary of the bill. And uh, forthcoming by the end of next week, we will have a side-by-side -side that will compare current law to uh, the new law. And so uh, those are all public resources and I'm sure we'll send out a link to everybody at the end. But those are a few things that are up already. That's great. Thanks, Kim. And I, yeah, I will remind folks, we'll make sure that you can, of course, you can Google Advanced CTE, but we'll show you the links for all the organizations where you can find some of those, those materials. I also want to thank uh, folks who are on the call who have been writing in questions. Uh, we're going to get to them shortly. Uh, I just want to uh, ask a couple more things from our panelists, but thanks for uh, typing those in there. My suggestion is that you try to type them in on the Q&A button and say, I think we're getting them in both the Q&A and the chat. So I'm trying to monitor both of those, but if you do the Q&A, it'll make it a little bit easier for me. Uh, but thank you. I'm glad that everybody's kind of weighing on this. We're gonna have some good questions. But Ned, let me turn to you. Um, 
uh, Kermit had mentioned a number of the things that are in, in the law that I know that you had some interest in, uh, certainly in, on industry engagement and sector partnerships on work-based learning. I mean, for you, kind of like what are the big takeaways that you think, because uh, Kim has noted very importantly that there's a lot still to be figured out in terms of how this is going to be implemented locally. And it sounds like now, relative to before, the conversation is going to be less between states and Washington and more between people within a particular state. Um, so what is it in here that you think the business community would be wanting to be paying attention to as those conversations proceed um, now there in their backyard as opposed to just in Washington, D.C.? Well, when we were working on the legislation, we went through a, a, a common set of of uh, efforts with each of the congressional offices, and that involved looking at the courses that were being taught in the high school closest to the district office, and comparing those to the jobs that were available in the in the in that particular area. It was very straightforward, and what we would hope would happen is that in that when that local uh, school system is submitting its plan to the state and then the state onward, that they newly ask the same sort of questions that we asked in those meetings. Uh, are the classes those that are best aligned with the needs of that locality in terms of jobs? Are they collaborating as well as they might with the community colleges and others so that the kids can not just get a high school degree, but possibly get some additional uh, coursework that will help them toward and associates or other certification? And um, are they reaching out to employers around work-based learning? Our feeling was that we saw a lot of great CTE courses out there, but that overall there was a high degree of variation and uh, the, the level wasn't as high as it might be in terms of that, those three points that I just lay, laid out there. So our hope would be that um, if you're with a school system, that there's a more intentional, more purposeful effort to reach out to employers. And then for our part, as employers, that we actually respond and help uh, with answering those questions about which soft and or hard skills are going to be the most useful. Certainly, the employers can fall down on this. Many employers aren't doing their piece around mentors and internships uh, or working with the school systems. But that's what we were looking for, Andy, was to increase the collaboration and the push towards collaboration between school systems and employers, all of whom are short on time, and to try to drive that process. As Kim notes, the legislative process is messy. They always talk about it as making sausage. And uh, so there are lots of things in there that can get uh, improved or changed or where you look at and kind of scratch your head as to how it happened. But if we come back in a couple of years and we feel like there's a better engagement between teachers and the folks that are developing curriculum and the, and the employers, then we'll feel like uh, all the effort's been well worthwhile. Great, excellent. So, um, so we've got a lot of questions that are coming in, um, and I'm going to try to kind of group some of them. Uh, there are some themes that are coming up from them. Um, there's a lot of questions that folks have interests in this new career pathways inclusion in, uh, in the new bill, in the new law, I should say. Uh, so questions about where is it, how well is it aligned with the new career pathways definition that we recently passed in WIOA? Um, what are school districts going to be expected to do to kind of develop K through J? So I've never heard that, but I'm going to assume that's kindergarten through jobs, and somebody can tell me if I've got that wrong. Um, in terms of kind of the, the the length of career pathways that school districts are now going to be expected to, to kind of piece out. Some questions about at the post-secondary level, where is the role of adult education in community colleges, and how is that going to be able to inform what's done around career pathways under this bill. So all of those issues around career pathways, let me just um, turn it over to anybody on the panel who wants to kind of respond to some of those questions. Uh, well, I'll let Kim talk to the technical stuff, but just to start off in terms of the need or the goal, Andy, what we found when we were looking at uh, a lot of the curriculum was that there were a lot of orphan classes that stood by themselves. And those tend to swallow up resources without providing the students 
much of an advance toward a job, or uh, there were uh, uh, a lot of uh, pathways that were swallowing up significant resources, and they, they had to have a lot side by side. So there was some effort just to try to make sure that this was as workable as possible. I'll let Kim speak to you know how successful they are. I will point out, though, that regulations and the like are forthcoming in this area, and so uh, some of the problems that we're creating in Congress can be fixed in the regulatory process. Um, yeah, so the, Go ahead. Uh, I'll take a stab at this. So um, I think that there is, this is an issue where it sounds very policy wonky, but words matter. Um, and there, uh, there absolutely is an intentional reference um, and the definition of career pathways is um, that that is in WIOA. There's also a definition in Perkins for program of study, um, which uh, there had not previously been one. And then there's also the term CTE program. And those three terms um, have different meanings and they are often used interchangeably. So I think it's important for people to look at them. Import the, the most important distinction, I think that um, you will see an opportunity for connection, but also a place of distinction is that a program of study by definition requires that there is a secondary and a post-secondary component. Um, and it is a sequence of instruction and it must actually start out broad and over time narrow in content specificity. So you're starting out and getting kind of introduction to the health professions and then over time narrowing to um, the actual technical skills that are needed for a nurse. A career pathway in the definition of WIOA says that it can be that, it can also just be a, a career pathway that's inclusive of the secondary community or inclusive of the post-secondary community, but it doesn't require the linkage between the two, but it could have that linkage between the two. It also doesn't require the progression of content specificity. And so I think a lot will depend on the choices that are made in terms of implementation uh, as to whether or not those uh, there are differences or linkages or they mean the same thing in terms of the implementation um, importantly the performance accountability system has in its definitions that um, you're only counting students who are in CTE programs or programs of study so um, uh, and so I think that's one of those places where there, there's a little bit of a technical difference of who potentially could be counted, and that can have a cascading effect on the um, policy implications. Philosophically, I believe that there was an intent of allowing there to be a maximum coordination and not having duplication of efforts, but wanting to see things that are started in secondary transition into post-secondary into the adult workforce space and that there's tons of on and off ramps. Um, and I think that I would really encourage anybody who's looking at this from an implementation standpoint to don't start with the law, start with what you need as a vision for your community, see what you're doing in WIOA, and then think about what and how Perkins um, kind of connects with that and can build momentum and accelerate progress. But um, I think if you start with the law, you're going to find more of the differences than the commonalities, if that makes sense. Yeah, great. Thank you, Kermit. Go ahead, Kermit. Yeah, I was going to say, so I think, you know, in um, and I, I want to 100% agree with what Kim is Saying both about the distinction between programs of study as they as they're defined and and uh, and their you know, the, the way that they interact with career pathways as they're defined under WIOA and and some of the challenges around how we're going to be capturing data on that. Um, I think the you know the one one way to think about the career pathways language in in Perkins. Uh, you know, if you think back, the, you know, the, the reason, you know, in WIOA, there's, this, there's a requirement that states and local boards be developing and implementing career pathways in partnership with secondary and post-secondary providers. And particularly when you're thinking about adult students, and, you know, one of the, one of the key best practices that's emerged over the course of the past decade is this recognition uh, that, you know, many people are going to be entering uh, post-secondary education, not directly out of a secondary uh, program, uh, but they'll be coming back into a program after they've been in the labor market for a number of years, or they may be transitioning from new jobs. And so the idea was with a career pathway as it's understood in the workforce space is you want to make sure that there are 
uh, multiple on-ramps and off-ramps, particularly for those adults and returning students, uh, to be able to get the skills and the credentials they need, not just to enter into an occupation, but also to continue to get the learning that they need. And that's really what a career pathway, uh, that's really how a career pathway is envisioned in, in WIOA. I think, so the good thing about, about the Perkins reauthorization is that it makes explicit that uh, CTE uh, does have a role to play. And, and in practice, I think that is in fact how this works. In many cases, those career pathway programs that, it, that, are, that are being implemented by community and technical schools, uh, they are being supported uh, in whole or in part through Perkins funding. Uh, and so it is important to make sure that there's clarity that, uh, that the, you know, as local state and local boards are thinking about developing career pathways, that they are talking to their CTE community and making sure that there's uh, alignment of effort or at least not duplication of effort. But I, I, I will agree with Kim that there is there is some confusion around uh, the sort of how this will be tracked. And, and, I, and you know, one thing that was unfortunate, I think, about the, the, the law is that while it, it does specify that career pathways are important from a state planning perspective, there's less of a focus on that at the local level. And so that may lead to some challenges in terms of implementation. The one other thing, because I know this came up in, in the questions that you were posing, Andy, so I did want to flag one, one change that was made in the Senate, uh, when the Senate made changes to the law was there is this addition of as part of the state planning process that the state adult education agency needs to be consulted as part of the, the planning process. And that, that kind of gets to the same issue of how are we making sure that we're integrating adult students into post-secondary programs of study and career pathways. Uh, I think that's a you know, good addition because we know that many folks who are uh, enrolling in post-secondary education are coming in sometimes either they've been out of school for a long time or you know they have basic skill needs uh, that need to be addressed in addition to the occupational skill needs so having the adult education community represented as part of the planning process at least in, in principle should lead to more conversations about how we're making sure that we're aligning both basic skills and occupational skills instruction in a way that sustains uh, and supports student completion so we were pleased to see that um, so I think I think that that uh, no, that was a good that was a good change great uh let me Kermit, let me turn to another set of questions that's coming in uh specifically on the issue of work-based learning and apprenticeship so um there is obviously interest in terms of what is encouraged versus what is required in the new law what are the new openings given all the other interests that's going on and other conversations that are taking place around apprenticeship in washington and in states that may be happening independent of what's been happening in this conversation within the context of career technical education. Generally, like what is it, what is it that we want to flag for people to be paying attention to that on that issue moving forward? Well, work-based learning was a specific uh, goal of the employer community. And again, just go back to where we started. We would look at the uh, programs of study from the high schools and they uh, tended to have, be really short on work-based learning or internship opportunities that are out there, which is particularly an is issue for disadvantaged kids or people in rural areas. And so we were looking to enhance that. And it shows up in a couple of different ways. There's a uh, inclusion of both the local and the state planning process uh, of requirements to expand work-based learning opportunities, as well as to increase the sort of opportunities that the teachers and professional staff might have for the similar opportunities to that will enhance their skills. And we think that that's a, a dramatic improvement just to start to ask those questions and, and to make sure that schools are seeking to do that. Because in the end, uh, disadvantaged families are not going to have these sort of opportunities uh, to create those, uh, those work-based learning opportunities on their own that would be true in some other uh, other families. There also is an optional uh, accountability metric around work-based learning. So as Kim uh, mentioned, there are some changes in accountability, but uh, one of the things that's supposed to happen is the, they're supposed to track a, a number of different outcomes. One of the ones that they can choose to track if they do so are work-based learning opportunities that, that will come through the process. So all those, I think, are movements in the right area. Is it a hard and fast rule? Absolutely not. You know, can states uh, and localities you know, continue to do a poor job in this area? Unfortunately, yes. And you'll still continue to see wide variation out there. But our hope is that this will increase something that clearly is part of the uh, road for opportunity for kids who are taking these CTE courses. 
Carmen, any other thoughts on that issue? Uh, you know, I think that, um, yes, yeah, so I think that, uh, as Ned pointed out, right, the, the role, uh, there is, you know, more of an emphasis in both the state, at the, both the state level and at the local level around requiring uh, access to work-based learning opportunities, which I think is a good thing. You know, I think what, one thing that, um, you know, one unfortunate uh, thing from our perspective is, you know, the, there is now for the first time a definition of work-based learning in Perkins. Um, uh, but it's it uh, but it does not actually explicitly talk about strategies like apprenticeship and on the job training and other practices that we know are are popular uh, and and have gained a lot of uh, interest from the business community and from from policymakers. It doesn't preclude using you know work based learning being apprenticeship or on the job training, but there's um, it would have been we think it would have been useful to more clearly signal that uh, work based learning uh, can include apprenticeship can include on the job training and other strategies. I think part of the the, the challenge and, and this is gets to something that, that Kim has uh, has referenced as well is you know again Perkins is a both a secondary and a post secondary program uh, uh, by design uh, and so the range of work based learning experiences that are appropriate for uh, a post secondary population are probably going to be you know potentially different from the, the the opportunities that should be made available for uh, for stu uh, uh, students who are secondary students particularly or or even middle skill students uh, so I think the the idea was to make sure that that definition was as as flexible as possible in order to accommodate local needs and, and the, the populations that you're trying to target. Um, but given the, the sort of the attention that we've seen from uh, Congress and, and from this administration around expanding apprenticeship, including a, expanding youth apprenticeship, uh, it, it does feel like a little bit of a missed opportunity to make that connection more explicit and make sure that uh, the resources that we may be using for apprenticeship strategies and, and expanding apprenticeship, uh, both, again, both at the adult and at the, the youth level, uh, helping to make sure that, that Perkins is engaged in those conversations uh, and the Perkins providers are at the table in those conversations. So, um, so it is good that the, that the law uh, does single out work-based learning as a, as, a, as a best practice, and we're thrilled to see that. And I think it you know, will hopefully as the implementation moves forward, uh, uh, states and, and communities will, will take advantage of the resources that are available for apprenticeship and, and the momentum around apprenticeship uh, to make sure that those opportunities are being made available to CTE students at both the secondary and the post-secondary level. Great. So I just want to flag that we're, uh, we've are we got about 10 minutes left uh, together before we all uh, plan out our Friday afternoon here at the beginning of August. Um, and I should say thank you again for everybody who's writing in questions. Obviously, we're not going to get to all of them, but I'm going to see what we can do to follow up as part of the follow up on this call. We're going to be sending out some resources from our partners and from National Skills Coalition on some of the things that we've talked about today. And I'll see what we can do to try to get some of these questions answered in writing if we can't get it answered uh, in the next 10 minutes. So um, lightning round for our folks on the panel, uh, see if we can cover a few more issues in the next, in the time remaining. There's a lot of questions folks have about different groups of students and workers and what the, what the improved or not improved prospects of their having access to career and technical education programs under this new law or what we're going to be trying to do to document equities or, or inequities between different populations. So, um, Kim, let me ask you about this. Juvenile yeah. justice facilities, foster youth, and where do we think there's going to be impacts on their access to CTE programs moving forward? So let me just say that this Perkins is um, a investment in systems, and it's investment in programs, um, and then the, so that it is not, um, the funding doesn't follow individuals, it doesn't, the funding doesn't follow, it's not an individual benefit program. Um, but to that end, I mean, there is an intentionality about serving those who um, have, have been underserved or who are um, not having access to high quality CT programs or their performance is below target. So juvenile justice um, is a population that is one that is an optional kind of investment to take um, at the state level. But let me back up and say, it used to be optional. It's now a required investment, but there is an option to spend more money on juvenile justice than they had um, in the past. And I would like to just kind of underscore that theme here that um, even in response to the last question about work-based learning and apprenticeship, 
this law in general has lots more options available, like kind of at looking at the list of use of funds. It has far fewer required things that you have to do. And to me, what that says to states and locals is in partnership with your stakeholders, have that conversation. Who has the greatest need? Who are we not serving? And support these resources to make sure that you're spending the time and effort around counseling, support services, and others to make sure that those students and learners have access to quality programs. And so I think that that's a general uh, instruction for other groups of folks who have been identified in the questions, folks who are working with immigrant workers and others, that a lot of this uh, is going to be figured out within your states and within localities. And so we should all be ready to try to make those cases as your, as your states and districts are figuring out how to implement this program moving forward. Uh, another couple of quick questions about um, other areas of policy that are relevant. So there's a fair number of questions. We've talked a lot about WIOA cross, you know, definitions that are going to be similar with Perkins definitions, that they're trying to kind of get the planning horizons uh, uh, lined up in terms of the number of years and things like that. Are there are workforce boards going to have a particular role in Perkins planning uh, moving forward? Kermit, what, what do you, what's the answer on that one? Uh, so yes, um, so state uh, workforce boards and, and workforce agencies are, are part of the consultation process at the at the state level, and and there is a um, there is a role for local workforce boards to be playing in in the consultation around the local applications that are are uh, that are being developed by by local uh, by by local secondary systems and post secondary institutions, uh, and I think that that's you know. Uh, that's a, again, it's a, it's a move in the right direction to at least have the opportunity for some discussion. I think it's one of the things that'll be interesting to watch as we, as we head into this 2020 cycle is, um, you know, both, both WIOA and, and Perkins have fairly, uh, have distinct, uh, planning processes. Uh, even if you do a combined plan at the, at the state level, uh, there's still, uh, both at the state and the local level, you still have distinct plans for WIOA and for Perkins. And so I think one of the things that's going to be sort of interesting, you know, and I think it's good that we have a, a year or so, you know, a couple of years to prepare for this, but I think this is going to be one of the key questions is, you know, how well uh, the various, uh, the various uh, a uh, agencies and leaders at the state and the local level can sort of work to coordinate those planning processes. It's, you know, it's not something that happens automatically. And, you know, one of the lessons we learned from WIOA implementation and the planning process there is, you know, it is, uh, it is it, that it, you can do a thoughtful and an inclusive process that brings a lot of stakeholders to the table. And that often is a, is a good, uh, that's a, that's a great way to make sure that you're getting to a shared vision, but it's, it's not easy. It's something that you have to be prepared to do. It's something you have to be very intentional about making sure that every voice is heard and everyone's at the table. And so I think this is going to be, this is going to be an interesting question and we'll see how states and, and communities are responding to this when, they get when we get to this point is how well can we sort of make sure that these conversations are, are continuing um, but but uh, uh, and, and we're meeting the requirements both under Perkins and WIOA for the planning process uh, but also making sure that those those conversations are not happening in isolation that there's some uh, effort to, co to coordinate and communicate across those planning processes and make sure that they're uh, we're, we're leveraging resources as effectively as we can while, while reducing uh, confusion for, our, for other stakeholders, particularly job seekers and students and businesses uh, who, who, uh, who are ultimately the end users of these, of these systems and these programs. So I think that's going to be uh, something that we'll be watching and hopefully working with our state and local partners to help sort of, sort of make sure that that process goes as smoothly as possible. Great. I mean, a uh, couple of questions on post-secondary programs. So um, just to confirm, is there anything in the law as currently written that's going to change the allocation of resources between secondary and post-secondary programs uh, moving forward? Anyone nope. Can take that? that is a state decision. The states get to decide that every time, every year if they want to. And do we think that that process now that it's going to be a, uh, there's a more explicit planning process articulated under this law and you know, the governors have to be checking in with a range of stakeholders. Do we think that that how those decisions get made are going to be made differently or is that something independent of the planning process that, that takes place? The decision of the split of funds is one that happens as part of the planning process. Mm -hmm. um, however, in some states it's actually legislated of what that split 
will is. So um, I don't know that the stakeholder engagement process will even influence that unless they were to influence state um, statute. But yeah, I mean, it's a, there's definitely a far more extensive and prescribed process and timeline um, and uh, who needs to be at the table for uh, the plan development process. So I would imagine um, the split of funds uh, tends to be one of the more um, interesting conversations that happens in states. And so I would imagine that it will be a more robust and interesting conversation this time around given uh, more seats at the table. Great. And then something else on post-secondary, maybe I can kick this to Ned or Kermit. Now that Perkins has been reauthorized, what do we think this means for the conversation around Higher Education Act reauthorization moving forward? Is anything that's happened in this reauthorization process likely to inform what happens in, the, in that next one? Uh, well, this is Ned. I'll let Kermit come after me, but absolutely. There's over $130 billion of federal funding in higher education. And when we are looking at places where we're going to cite in the United States, I often we'll look at the colleges to see how many graduates they have and whether they're well aligned with our needs. And unfortunately, I find all too often the same thing that we found with the CTE courses, which is that alignment tends to be outdated and the number of folks coming through aren't where they, they need to be. So there's a lot of opportunities for improvements that will help kids. And of course, you know, there's no worse inequity than the, a class that isn't going to help anyone toward a job. You know, that's, that's a, it's an equal handed problem that's out there. So I think that the success here is going to feed into our efforts on the Higher Education Act in a substantial way and try to help make sure that all the populations that currently are that need better skills, some portion of which are going to go through higher education, are able to get that. I mean, I'll just I'll add um, just sort of you know a couple of other points. I mean, I think that you know obviously the fact that we've reauthorized Perkins uh, means that there is uh, certainly political space uh, for the for the relevant committees to focus on the Higher Education Act reauthorization now that they've. They've done, we've done RIOA, we've done uh, ESSA, we've done Perkins. Now, the, you know, really the big, the big remaining piece of education and workforce legislation out there is, is the Higher Education Act. And so certainly this clears the decks from the committee perspective and from congressional perspective to focus on that. So, so certainly that independent of what's in the law itself, I think that, that creates some space. I think the, you know, the other thing that, and this is, you know, speaks to, um, uh, you know, some of Ned's earlier comments. I mean, I think there is, you know, we're in a, obviously we're in a scenario where, you know, we have relatively low unemployment rates. And, and I think there's a, you know, there's clearly a lot of interest from the business community and from other stakeholders in uh, making sure that federal policy is generating the kinds of skills and credentials that are necessary in today's labor market. Um, and so I think it, I do think that the the conversation that we've seen around Perkins and, and the role that it plays in uh, helping develop uh, pipelines of skilled workers for local and regional business uh, businesses, uh, but also making sure that people get the skills that they need in order to be successful in today's economy. I definitely think that that is going to carry over into the Higher Ed Act conversation. Certainly, um, some of the, the legislation that we've seen introduced in this Congress around higher education seems to indicate that there's a lot of policymaker interest in, in thinking about the, the intersection between higher education and uh, and 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 labor the labor market. So I do think it will have a uh, some carryover effect. I think the the big question going into next year is going to be sort of what what impact that's going to have and and the extent to which um, we're we're seeking to better align Higher Education Act with Perkins and and WIOA and other programs. But uh, but I do think it will have an impact. All right. Well, thank you, folks. We're at one o'clock Eastern, um, and we are just scratching the surface, I can tell. So if we could put the slide up to make sure that folks who are still on can at least see if you want to get more information from any of these three uh, excellent uh, organizations represented here today. Um, there's contact information there for Advanced CTE, for National Skills Coalition, and for the Perkins CTE Coalition that uh, Ned and IBM have been helping to lead. I know uh, Kim has already noted that Advanced CTE is doing, has already done a red line and is going to be doing a side-by-side -side analysis on uh, with the new law versus the old. Um, and so we'll make sure that uh, we can at least tell you where that's going to be uh, once it's up. Um, 
and Natural Skills Coalition will also be kind of do, will be doing some of its analysis and putting out some additional information through our website and through uh, our other channels of communication. And we'll see what we can do to capture some of the questions that I really appreciate the questions that folks put up today around data issues. It sounds like we could have a whole conversation just about data issues as it relates to the implement, implementation of this law around a range of other issues uh, in terms of the institutional implications for colleges and high schools and others. So we'll see what we can answer in writing and we'll see if there's opportunities for us to have some further conversations in this type of format uh, moving forward. So thank you everybody. It was great to have you uh, dialing in today. Thank you, Ned and Kim and Kermit, for your time and your expertise. You were awesome, uh, and, and I really appreciate your being a part of this. And otherwise, I just want to say, everybody, have a great Friday afternoon. Have a great summer weekend. Have a good rest of your summer, and we'll be back in touch on these and other issues moving forward. Thanks a lot.